Professor Khalid Ann has contributed to many trials and meta-analyses, which has run 48 primary research trials, recruiting 979,242 participants. Finally, Professor Khalid Khan is a renowned gynecologist, formerly is the lead author of us, our research, which you can find online as on systematic review to support evidence-based medicine, with whom which he won a BMA Medical Book Award. Uh, if I want to continue reading about his biography, I think this will take us the whole day. Uh, allow me to invite uh, Professor Khalid Khan to give us his presentation. You're welcome, sir. Well, thank you very much. Can I just confirm if you can hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to start to share the screen and you can let me know if the screen sharing is also working fine are you able to yeah, see we can the screen properly we can see all right thank you very much so the topic of uh, my presentation is about uh, integrity in clinical trials um, during my presentation I am happy at any stage to take question or comment via the chat function, uh, but also at the end of the presentation, if time allows, uh, I can entertain questions. Further, tomorrow I will have another opportunity to join your uh, course, and I will be delighted to take any further questions tomorrow. May I just confirm if this communication that I just said uh, was received fine at your end. Would anybody in the audience be able to say if you heard me and saw the slides um, adequately at your end? Please, can you confirm? Eva Saleh said yes, so I presume I can just continue. Okay, thank yes, you. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, th thank you very much. So, I intend to talk a little bit about myself, give you an orientation, and then talk about the three key aspects of trial planning, conduct, and publication, and finally give you a summary. So, for myself, I started training uh, as a doctor in uh, Pakistan and to your region in East Africa, uh, in uh, Kenya, where I started my clinical training. Then I returned to Pakistan, uh, followed on from there to, to research training in Canada. And then I spent nearly 25 years in the UK before just two years ago, three years ago, uh, moving to Granada uh, in Spain. Alongside this career, my first research article was published in 1990. Uh, my first systematic review was published in 1995. I had the opportunity to edit various journals, write a book on systematic reviews, and we will cover systematic reviews of trials uh, in detail tomorrow. I also had the opportunity to work as research director in two large hospitals in the UK and was chief editor of, of a journal. And this experience gave me an understanding of the issues related to integrity. I had the chance to present uh, content of this kind in various countries. I also was co-author of articles that recruited over uh, 12, 13,000 participants in randomized trials. 
so with this background, I am able to give you some understanding of what is research integrity and how it applies to clinical trials. So when we talk about integrity, frequently we talk about the thalidomide disaster. This obviously was investigated and then implemented as a, uh, as a correction of a previous decision by removing the drug from use uh, in pregnancy. Um, another example frequently talked about is the syphilis experiments, which were conducted without, ethic, without uh, proper consent. But this is historical. The question is, is this a common problem even today? So we can look at the COVID-19 pandemic. Here you see an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, submitted or work undertaken at Harvard Medical School. So I presume you can imagine that the whole world will look at this article coming from a top institution uh, published in a top journal as being highly informative. But guess what? Within days of its publication, uh, expression of concern is issued. So we are talking about within a month of publication, there is a concern expressed. And then this article has been retracted subsequently. So you can see that top journals and world's top universities that win many Nobel prizes are not immune from problems related to research misconduct. If this comes to you as a surprise, this is actually a worldwide problem. And uh, over 200 papers concerning COVID-19 have been retracted already within just three years of the appearance of this condition on the, uh, in the dictionary of uh, medical literature. And six of these retracted articles have been randomized controlled trials. So with this background, I think any course of the kind that you are receiving, it's important for us to cover the issue of how to demonstrate in your publication that the trial that you conducted has integrity. Now, please don't think that this is a problem specific to Comstech countries or low income countries or African or Asian countries. Here is a survey from Holland, from Northern Europe, where you would expect that fraud in research is uncommon. But even here, one in every 12 researcher admits to there being a possibility of misconduct through their own personal experience in working in the current day. This is an article published only in 2021. And the issue of misconduct is now all over the literature. Only if you cast an eye concerning uh, uh, this, not just in scientific literature, but also in uh, the, the daily newspapers. And the, and the definition of misconduct or problems concerning integrity is related to a serious deviation from the ex ex accepted practice. I think there is another element to this, which is that the, that the deviation is intentional. And then there is a separate issue of how it should be investigated and, and, and what is the standard of proof uh, for demonstrating. So the point I want to highlight here is that if you are going to undertake trials following this workshop, you should conduct yourself and, and engage in publication in a manner 
that you demonstrate that your research has integrity that people if they have questions that once they look at your work they can be confident that there aren't any integrity concerns so with this background i would then like to move to talk about uh, different aspects of conducting a trial and how integrity should be demonstrably integrated in the process at this stage may i just ask uh, if there is uh, any comment or concern raised so far in my presentation or may i continue okay so you may continue uh, I, Okay, Th thank you, Dr. Heba, for, uh, for confirming that I can continue. So here is the life of a clinical trial. You start with a clinical problem you want to solve. And the idea is that in the end, it should improve the outcome of patients. And it goes through a journey where your design trial needs ethics approval following which it should be registered, uh, the consent should be obtained, the data collected should be monitored before a manuscript is prepared for submission to a journal, and then publication ethics apply at that time. So with this in mind, we keep pro progressing. The challenge for researchers or trialists is that they stay clear of scientific misconduct and questionable practices which are listed here and they demonstrate in the publication that this is the case in their work so ethics and conduct of the study are key issues uh, with respect to scientific misconduct and how can you demonstrate that you have stayed clear of these problems? Well, I have uh, the privilege of being editor of the research topic on integrity of clinical trials in the Frontiers uh, Journal. So I speak to you with experience as a journal editor concerning this aspect. Well, first of all, what is a clinical trial? I think it would have been made clear to you that there is an overlap of terminology uh, where some types of clinical trials like phase one and phase four trials are not randomized trials phase two and phase three phase three definitely are randomized trials and phase two can also be randomized trials so these are the ones we are talking about and a trial typically compares two options uh, a new treatment with an existing treatment and follows people up to measure their outcomes. And the idea is that there should be a control group, there should be blinding implemented if that is possible, and the sample size should be adequate. And with these features, randomized trials and systematic reviews of randomized trials rank at the top of the evidence hierarchy. People are included in the sample with their consent allocated to control or intervention then followed up and their outcome is measured and with the outcome data collected it's possible to construct a two by two table comparing the outcome against of intervention against control and with this an effect size or odds ratio or relative risk can be calculated this result is then if the study conducted is, is uh, with robust methodology, this result is then true or and applicable to the study sample. And if the study sample is representative of the population, then this result is also applicable to the population that did not take part in the study as part of the sample and perhaps is also applicable to the wider population. 
So the idea is to conduct the study in such a way that the result obtained is true and applicable to the sample and to the population wider other than the sample. For this, the trials need to be large. They need to have inclusion criteria that help to generalize the findings and multi-center trials assist in achieving large studies that have generalizable findings. So with this background, we now move to thinking about research translation. Lab research can be applied then to human participants with uh, the journey called research translation. And this journey involves various types of studies and phase one, two, three, and four trials fit in this research journey in the way as shown on the slide. Now, T2 translation or phase two type studies tend to be small pilot feasibility or early studies. The multi-center studies are the phase three trials. And these are then put through systematic reviews into guidelines. And the guideline aspect is something that we are going to talk about in more detail tomorrow. Research integrity applies to all aspects of the research all across the translation journey. The two key principles in research integrity are ethics and professional conduct. So these are the two basic ideas behind research integrity and avoidance of misconduct. So I ask you a question. Let's say you are an investigator who's going to start a trial. It is a cluster randomized trial, and you would like to apply for ethics committee do you think ethics committee approval do you think you can ask the ethics committee to waive the need for informed consent i think it is likely that most of you would believe that informed consent is 100 percent necessary but in this case i urge you to think that it's a cluster trial where instead of individuals uh, centers provinces or uh, hospitals will be randomized, not individuals. And in this case, perhaps you could be brave enough to seek ethics committee approval for avoiding individual consent. In this case, I give you an example of a trial where I've been involved as a co-investigator. The intervention is peer support for breastfeeding and the standard care is the usual care delivered where without peer support, uh, breastfeeding is, uh, is uh, being introduced or uh, encouraged through health professionals. And in this situation, around 60 practices or, clinic or community centers are randomized. And in this case, the individual consent uh, we requested that it is waived, and the ethics committee did give us approval to waive the consent in this case. Another example is blinding in a surgical trial, and we seek the committee to give us permission to blind patients to allow us to not tell them that they are having a sham incision or an incision for the real surgery. And in this case, the committee also gives us permission to apply the sham incision uh, and keeping the patient blind. So you can see that as an investigator, in order to conduct studies in a way that produce valid results, it is possible to seek approval for even some unused for something that is considered a little bit unusual. Now, let's say the study has received approval. You, as a researcher, has appointed research nurses who will be obtaining informed consent. 
how can you ensure that the consent obtained will be the correct uh, consent in accordance with the ethics committee approval in this case you can ensure that good clinical practice course is delivered within your uh, research project that all the staff taking part have undertaken this course and therefore will be able to comply with the protocol will protect the participants right and will meet any regulatory or ethics committee requirements placed within the study indeed if you work in a center uh, that has uh, uh, the relevant department for oversight of studies uh, uh, in 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 some countries these departments are called r and d departments in other countries may have other names uh, they can subject your study to monitoring audits and inspections and they will be able to check whether the consent is being applied correctly within your study I now ask you another question. Uh, I imagine one of you in the course will, will be or will one day be the director of a hospital or a clinic where you have the responsibility to give oversight to studies. You may not be the investigator, uh, but you have the responsibility to ensure that investigators undertake the research according to the rules. In this case, if you receive a complaint either from a patient or a staff member that some patients have been recruited without consent or without proper consent how will you investigate think about this question it's an important question because no research should be conducted without proper consent In this case, your department should have a policy available for investigation or offering oversight uh, when a complaint is raised. Here you have a flow chart as an example that you can apply. And, and uh, these type of flow charts can be found in, uh, in, in, in various organizations that you can take and adapt for your own organization. So now, after dealing with the study that is conducted, we move to the issue of publication. The usual cycle of publication is the following. You submit, you are peer reviewed, you are sort revisions, you revise, and then you resubmit. At this stage, the paper may be accepted or during the course of peer review or following publication concern may be raised that the study has been conducted without proper integrity um, principles applied or misconduct has taken place uh, either during the course of the study or during the course of its peer review and publication Now, this is a, a serious matter because it appears through a published systematic review that a very large proportion of journals don't even have their instructions to authors clear concerning ethics approval. The, at the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors insists that, for example, you should follow rules of publication ethics using for example the rules provided by committee on publication ethics one of those rules is that the trial should be prospectively registered this registration means that the trial should be put on a public platform before the first patient is recruited there are some basic requirements in this registration platform which should be met and once the trial is registered subsequently before the study is submitted for publication the protocol can also be published so that peer reviewers and the public has the opportunity 
to see what did you promise to deliver to the ethics committee and at the time of peer review the peer reviewers can assess whether what you did was according to your registration and the published protocol at the time of submission to the journal the peer reviewers can assess your article according to the consort guideline and you should yourself prepare the article according to this reporting guideline now the next set of issues concerning the statistical requirements for the publication of the trials now we can see here that a large proportion of journals don't make their statistical requirements clear to authors ideally the trial should make its statistical analysis plan also available publicly the statistical analysis plan is not always part of the registration nor is it always part of the ethics committee approval it is usually something that is prepared during the course of the trial before the final data set is closed and made available for statistical analysis shall analysis plan available to the journal at the time of uh, submission of your manuscript so the question is how often does data falsification or fabrication take place 